Okay, uh, we're in lecture number three. It's chapter 14. Uh, chapter 14, if you read through it uh, relatively quickly, it's a flat spanning concrete systems, which is a flat spanning slab. So in our world, it's called continuous spanning slabs. So I've put on the canvas in the file section of 4060, a uh, tutorial that shows you a guide, a study guide. It has on it uh, 4060 chapter 14 problem solving guide. Spring 2020 and it's got number one in dark letters, continuously spanning slabs. That's the handout you'll be using for this chapter. It's a design aid for solving the following reinforced concrete elements, continuously supported concrete slabs. So we've already had a lecture on simple slabs. That was chapter 13.5. Uh, we're taking it one step further. When I did that lecture, I kind of showed you what we were going to get ourselves into. Uh, so let's, uh, let's draw you a picture and uh, make sure you understand uh, what you're designing and how it's laid out. If you go to page uh, 481 of your text, they show you a overall layout. It looks something like this. It's got a column line. It's got several columns. It's got another column line. And it looks like this. So there's columns. On the drawing, these column lines are going to be labeled, typically letters and numbers. So I can get around it pretty easily if I wanted to know what's happening and I wanted to direct someone to this column right here. I'd tell them it's column B2. So they take B and run it over, two drop it down, and they'd be at the intersection, which is B2. Uh, this particular one, this is the outside edge of the slab. So I'm going to put a little line right here and kind of draw the slab's edge. So the slab's got an edge running right here. And a la another line running here. And depending on how big the building is, it can go this way and that way as far as you want. Okay, so this is the system. The system is made up of columns, these big squares, girders, which are large column of beams going between columns. So I got a big girder going through here. And then the girders then have the beams tied into them. So I got beams running through here. And that would go all the way through, of course, to the bottom section. Okay, on top of this is a concrete slab. So the system is made up of components. And if I took a section right through here and I looked at it, I would end up with a picture that looks like the picture that is on... Uh, the bottom of page four, uh, 482, I like the other one, I like another one better, the one on page 486. So they show two, uh, on page 486, they show two beams, so their section runs right there, okay? So it's a picture showing the slab on top of beams. Okay, it's continuous. A continuous slab means that it is, goes all the way over the top of the beams without having a cold joint. It's poured continuous, monolithic pour. So that's what our section is going to look like this. And this is what we're going to be using most of the time for this particular unit. And this should coincide with that picture on page 482. Okay. It's this section right through here. You can see that the span is between the beams, so the slab spans from beam to beam. 
We are going to design it just exactly the way we did a simply supported beam. We're going to take and we're going to cut a one foot section right through here, 12 inches wide. And we're going to design that 12 inch strip and then that 12 inch strip is representative of all the 12 inch strips next to it in both directions. So once I design this 12 inch strip, I've basically designed the whole slab. So it's monolithic, it's one way. One way means the main steel goes one direction, which means this dimension is less than half of this dimension. Okay, so it's a one way slab, it's continuous, so the wording for this problem, this is chapter 14, is different than chapter 13, five by this is continuous. The other one, we would have had a cold joint on the center of each of these beams and we'd have poured a slab here, a slab here, a slab here, then came back and filled it in with slabs. Those would be simple slabs. This one's monolithic. The beams and the slab are all poured together. It makes one nice, big system, so the beams are part of the slab. Okay, so there's our picture. That's gonna be a, the important part of this particular unit is that picture right over there. So uh, the one I would use, I wouldn't use the one on page 482. I would go back to page 486 and use that picture. Okay, 482 though, if you happen to like it. Don't like the top part. Okay, we are not designing beams in this chapter. If you read 14.2 figure, the caption next to it says approximate design factors for concrete beams. The whole top of that page means nothing to us in this course. Okay, so if you want to look at anything on page 482, just look to that little bottom part that has the approximate design factors for continuous slabs with spans of 10 feet or less. So, and that is the same picture that's on page 486. And I like 486, okay? So how are we gonna do this? Well, you've got your handout. The procedure is similar, but not the same as doing a simple slab. We are gonna determine the thickness of the slab based on that same table we used for simple slabs. And then we're gonna check concrete, we're gonna check steel, and we're gonna put temperature steel into it. So the process is pretty much taken off of the simple slab design, but since it is continuous, there's more factors to deal with. So we gotta deal with all the factors. So I'm gonna get rid of this. Hopefully you understand we're perpendicular to the beams. That's the strip, it's 12 inches wide. And now we've got load to worry about. We've gotta find moment, we've gotta find compression into concrete, we gotta find the tensile steel required and the steel required for uh, temperature or shrinkage. So let's start. Uh, I think probably the best way to do this would be to look at a problem in your book and the problem you're gonna have to do is 14.1b. So I'm gonna pick 14.1a. And we'll go about it and we'll try to figure out what we're doing and why we're doing it. I'm gonna populate this picture over here. If you look on page 486, it has moment coefficient C, moment coefficient C, and underneath it, it has minus 1 12th plus 1 14th minus one-tenth and one-twelfth plus one-sixteenth minus one-twelfth minus one-twelfth. Okay, let me, let me tell you what the moment coefficient does for us and hopefully you can relate it to what we've done in the past. Okay, uh, we're gonna figure out what the moment is at each of those points over the top of the end in the middle of the span, over the top of the first support, middle of span, top of second support, okay? 
To do that, we need a moment equation. You guys are used to a moment equation for a simple beam. So if I have a simple beam, uniformly loaded, you go to page 114, you find out M is equal to big W L over eight. So you've used that equation many, many times already. Okay, you've used it not knowing that there was a moment coefficient. This is really, the moment equation really looks like this. A moment coefficient multiplied by big W L. Okay, that's the equation you've been using. You didn't realize that this is the moment coefficient, and for this beam, the moment coefficient is one plus one eighth W L. Okay, so we're going to be using that same equation, but at various points. Along that beam, the moment varies. And the moment coefficient is going to be applied to this equation right here. So if I wanted the moment right here, I would use minus 1 12th WL. Here, plus 1 14th WL. Plus 1 16th WL. Minus 1 12th WL. So the moment varies across the slab for continuous, where it doesn't vary for a simple. So we're going to be using that moment coefficient, and since it varies, we're going to do it in generic form, and then substitute this C into the formula to take place of the generic form, make it the specific location. So we're going to do that right now. So how are we going to do this? Okay, let's look at the problem. I'm going to write down the data. And then we're going to evaluate the data based on the handout that I gave you. It says 14.1a, a solid one-way slab is to use for framing system similar to that in figure 14.1. The columns are spaced at 36 feet. So here, I'm just going to draw it. There's columns, 36 feet apart. Okay, there's your columns, 36 foot apart. Uh, with regularly spaced beams at 12 feet. So if I take that 36 and divide it by three, I think you get 12 feet. So I've got columns now at 36, and then I've got beams running between these columns. They're at 12 feet. So that's what it would look like. Three spaces, 12 foot each. Three twelves is 36. So if I looked at that picture over there and I took this, section, just like I did before, I would have to put a dimension between these guys of 12 feet. So that's just this section right through there. So that's what those words are telling you in that problem. So now I've got my picture updated. I can get rid of this guy. And then let's move on. It says the uh, columns are spaced at 36 with regular uh, space beams at 12 foot center to center. Superimposed dead load of 40 pounds a square foot. Dead load, 40 pounds per square foot. Uh, superimposed live load of 80 pounds a square foot. Eighty pounds a square foot. Use concrete of four and steel of sixty.
To determine the thickness for the slab, select the size and spacing of the bars. So we've got three things to do here that are direct metrics, and we've got a couple checks to do. So our three things are, what is the thickness of the slab? So if I take a look at this, they're asking me what this is. Okay? Then they're going to ask me to size the bars. And if you look at that picture on page 486, the bottom one kind of looks like this. If you look at it, it kind of looks like that. Okay? So not only do I have to size a bar, I have to size the bars. The bars at each of these locations. And of course, that's a mirror image. If I flip the other end, it would be here. So once I got the middle, it just repeats itself over and over again. So I got bars to worry about there, then I've got bars to worry about here. This is the main steel, the long lines, and these are the temperature steel. So if you look at this, the temperature steel is going along the length of the building, so from side to side. And then the main steel goes between the beams. So these are between the beams. These are the beams, 12 foot center in our case. Okay, they gave me all the data. Now let's take a look at the handout. It says, determine the minimum thickness required using that same table we used for 12 point, or, uh, for uh, chapter 13.5, simple slabs. Enter the table using the member type and conditions and yield stress of the reinforcing steel. The chart's gonna give you an L over. Now here's something you need to make sure you've got circled, highlighted, or whatever. Last time, the span was a direct number. This time, the span is not a direct number. The span is the distance, clear distance between the face of the supports. So the span is this. It's not 12 feet. The span is this distance right here. That's a span. So what is it? It's the center to center distance minus the width of the beam. Now they assume one foot. On a test, it's not gonna be one foot. So don't put one foot there. Read the problem, it's gonna tell you how wide that beam is. And once you take half of this beam and half of that beam and subtract it from the 12 foot, you've got the distance between the faces of the beam, which is the span. So, how are we gonna do this? Well, it's a little different. If you go back to the end of chapter 13, to the very end, to page 478, I believe it is. Okay, you're on page 478. You've already been here. If you did what I told you last time, you had 